No. Welcome to everybody. What you see here is the 10th week lecture, if I'm not wrong, of the Drive Techniques uh, PhD lesson. And during the last weeks, we were, we were uh, talking about engines mostly, two-stroke engines, four-stroke engines, gasoline en engines, diesel engines, and also electrical engines, continuous current engine, and also uh, alternative current engines. This all was to understand and to see what and how is the basic of our transmission chain and how we can have, uh, not how we can, but what we have to use for driving a vehicle. Mostly I'm talking, I'm talking about road vehicles or railway vehicles, uh, but also the principles can be applied for, for, uh, for airplanes or ships and also for other type of vehicles. No. So now we know the engines. And before I s continue, there, was question, there, were, there were questions about if this material is available for who or how people can access it. So those who have already found this channel and these topics uh, see that it's an official channel of the department of university. And here we are at the Technical University of Budapest for the foreign students. And uh, this is a department of railway uh, vehicles and railway uh, vehicle structure analysis. The earlier video had a different logo, earlier videos had a different logo, and this was the department of the vehicle elements and vehicle structure analysis, but the topic are not changing. As the science is large and topics are identical for different branches of science, these videos are still there, and you are free to access, free to share, free to learn of uh, or learn from. And also, if you enjoy it, we are really glad to see that our work is efficient. So, TU Budapest and Department of Railway Vehicles and Vehicle Structure Analysis, or System Analysis, sorry. Now, let's, back, let's get back to our uh, topics. And now, a small sum up of the engines, and then we start with the transmission line as such. Okay. So now we have learned a lot of, uh, about engines and we can draw a summary of engine torque curve characteristics. Uh, you may say it's really elementary thing, of course it is. But these days, actually we are in 2021 when we make this video, we are just in the middle of a transition from internal combustion engines to electrical engines. And this transition requires a very important uh, transition also in the way transmissions are built, because some parts became obsolete some parts became unnecessary and other parts became much more important and the study of, of transmissions has again a changing in the, in the priorities. But we start from the engine curves as beginning. To compare, it's really e interesting to see. Let's suppose that regardless the engine type we get a nominal, let's say, maximal torque in newton meter, no, in percentage. Ay, ay, ay. I try to make a percentage symbol. And here the number of rotation in RPM. And I try to sum up what we have learned till now. If I'm talking about internal combustion engines, Maybe you remember that we get an N mean minimal RPM, which is the idling of an internal combustion engine. And for all engines, we get an N max. N max being the RPM, the revolution per minute, at which the engine can turn long time 
without disintegration, without failure. So let's see the typical curves. Uh, maybe we start with electric engines. If you, have, if you remember, we had this type of torque curve. What was this? It's an electric engine torque curve. Yes, and which type of current it uses? Direct current, exactly. So this is a DC engine plus serial excitation. This is what we use in tramways, or it's, they, they were used in tramways mostly, and also in uh, small railways, suburban railways, at least in my country. Also, the second type, which is used mostly these days, it looks like this one. Which type of electric engine belongs to this curve? I'm asking the students here. Mm -hmm. Or you can chat, put it in the chat if you like. I see there are at least one people watching this live. So this was here a DC, uh, an alternative current engine. And from the alternative current engines, we have learned about the synchronous engine and asynchronous engine. And this was the asynchronous engine. Okay, alternative current asynchronous engine, you see that the curves are completely different. So when you drive a car with these, you might need different transmission chain for them. And if we get back to the internal combustion engines, if you get a scooter or some small motorbike with a two-stroke engine, it's typical, typical, typical to look or to see a curve like this. This is what we get for a two-stroke engine, a two-stroke gasoline engine. So motorbikes and company, two-stroke gasoline engine. Just for seeing differences or similar similarities. If we get a normal four-stroke gasoline engine, let's say not so big, I mean by not so big between, let's say, 1.2 and 2 liters, roughly, then we get something like that. Aspirating engine, not a turbo one. This is a four stroke gasoline engine. And if we get a diesel engine, again, aspirating, not only aspirating, or, 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 or also it can be a, a smaller turbo diesel, then we get this kind of torque curve. Okay, so this is diesel. Roughly. Okay, do you see? So there's a big variation of curve shapes. And it's important because your transmission should fit these curves. There's a mathematical operation that uses these curves as a base for driving your car. So your transmission should be designed and sized depending on the characteristic of these curves. So if you change the engine from a diesel to an asynchronous, you've got to go after with your transmission chain. If you're to your scooter, you put I've just read yesterday. 
if you put uh, an electric engine to your Vespa scooter. You switch the transmission from transmission, the engine torque from here to there. Again, you've, go, you've got to go up there with your transmission. So let's see how and what. So this is what your engine can give and what your vehicle uh, does need. So torque need of the vehicle. High torque. At start, for sure, you've got to put your weight into motion. You need also high torque at top speed. because you have to win the air resistance usually, or the water resistance for a ship, independently of what you get. For sure, you need a smaller torque smaller torque when driving. at constant speed. For example, if you're designing a locomotive for railways, you've got to put huge power in it because you get very heavy wagons. And the locomotive gives its, poof, its full power at start to put the oil system, hundreds of tons into motion. Once the train is going, at a constant speed, it has, it keeps, it uses the, let's say, 50 to 30% of its power. The same for an airplane, for example. To take off, it uses full power. When cruising at constant speed in the air, it uses much less. Let's say 80, 70, 80% to keep altitude. Okay, so it is things like that. And when we need high torque again, we need high torque at acceleration. Regardless the speed. Obviously, highest at starting from zero speed. But if you want to accelerate from 50 by hour till 100 by hour, again, you need torque for making it. If you get a, I don't know, a weak car, small car, it takes a long time to accelerate from 50 to 100 kilometer by hour. If you get a car that has large torque or the engine can be overloaded, it has a spectacular peak torque for some seconds, like a Tesla or other electric car, you get the acceleration in some seconds, but this is not a peak torque that, can, that, the, that the, the vehicle can support for infinite time. It's a very important thing. Uh, in Japan, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, there were guys who were playing a speed race in the highways. Maybe you have heard about. It was the famous Midnight Club. Midnight Ukureibu in Japanese, in Tokyo. And there was play, they were playing to go by 300 km by hour on the open highways. And they were tuning cars for reaching and keeping this speed. Reaching was not that difficult, but keeping. And the experience was that in that time there were some Japanese cars 
that could keep 300 for more than 10 minutes without overheating. And there were famous European cars, expensive European cars, that could not keep 300. They were overheating in one, two, three minutes. Though nice and expensive. So, keeping a speed and reaching a speed are different things, very different things. And if you look at the basic data of a Tesla Model S that you get into your, mm, I don't know if you get official papers for, for, for the car, the nominal constant long time power is ridiculously small. You can drive 130 kilometer per hour in Europe without problem with a Tesla. But if you want to use the full power, for example, the race on a racetrack, it will overheat really quickly. If I say quickly, let's say no more than five minutes. So what's interesting for us is the constant top speed and the torque need a constant top speed. We may have puffer for short times, but the interesting, interesting is the constant, what we can keep for hours. Okay, so it's a question of philosophy. For what are you designing the thing? But they are quite important things. If you get, for example, this famous uh, one quarter mile uh, drag races, and the guy stands at a white line, and at the green light, he is just accelerating at full throttle. But the whole race lasts, let's say, 10 seconds, not more. Then you can get out extraordinary power for, from small engines. If you get a race of 24 hours, like in Le Mans, in France, then you've got to turn around for 24 hours. The peak power is much less because it has to last. Okay, so it's a very interesting thing, very interesting thing in this. Now, so from the torque need, we get the following curve. Here we get the speed, let's say in kilometer by hour. Here you get what a car likes. It's the FV, F, F, I call it FD being the drag force, the force that pulls the car on the wheels, drag force. And that's starting large force, then it reaches a small but constant level. And around highest speeds, again, it goes up. And for the transmission design, it depends how you choose your top speed. Is it a small one, medium one, large one, really, really extra large one? This how you've got to design your thing. Usually, we say the resistance starts to increase around 80 kilometer by hour. This is something like 55 miles or 52, 51 miles in the US. And above this, resistance increases uh, quadratically. Have you learned this thing? Nothing is learned here. Have you learned these things before? Not yet. Okay. Then some words about the resistances that a vehicle can have when moving forward. Sorry. When moving forward. Resistances acting on a moving vehicle. independently of, of the type. Bicycle, car, railway vehicle, ship, airplane, independently. The theory, and, and not the theory, but the basics to understand. So we have resistance, resistant force, force res, resistant force. It's composed of the following component. You get the F road resistance road resistance plus 
what else? F rolling resistance plus F force of inertia plus F of the air, air drag. Okay? These are the four components. If you get a ship, instead of the road, you get the water. If you get an airplane, you don't have the road. You don't have the rolling. You get the inertia and you get the air. But also for takeoff, you are on the, on the, on the airfield. So you get the road and rolling. OK? So these are the basic, basic types of resistance. Then, some words about these. I'm using the forces here and not torque because force time the easily you can convert. If you get a torque M here, you are on the road, you get a tire radius RG, and you can convert the drag force to a drag torque by multiplication. So you get what you have here, you get uh, FD drag force, okay? Both are used. For resistances, it's better to use forces, it's easier. Okay, now, for the road, for the types, F road is nothing else than the slope of the road. M times G times sinus alpha, where alpha is the angle of the, of the slope. So if your car is going uphill and you get a slope alpha, then this force is against your moving forward. If you are going downhill, this force helps you and decrease in, in the vehicle. So this force can be positive or negative, depending on the orientation of the slope. Okay. Then, 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 I go a bit further. For the rolling force, rolling resistance. The rolling resistance comes mainly from from what we get, M times J times cosinus alpha. So again, we get the orientation of the slope. So the flat road, the uh, up, uphill road and downhill road has got different, different uh, rolling resistance. But the important is to have here a member called phi. This is the Greek letter phi times constant one plus uh, bracket 0, 0,006 times V square and bracket and bracket. What is this actually? M is the weight of the car for sure. J is the gravity coefficient, which is 9.81 meter by second square, roughly. Alpha is the slope of the road, zero positive or negative. And what is this thing here? Actually, actually, this is something that we can uh, compare to a kind of friction, to a kind of friction here. I will call it really a kind of friction for the tire on the road. And why do I call it a kind of friction and not directly a friction coefficient? That's because it is a more complicated thing. Maybe you know that if you look at a car and you look at a tire, how looks a surface, how looks the surface like that 
enters in contact with the soil, with the road. We can see it's a kind of circular, elliptical, egg-looking of something similar surface. Okay? Measurements have been made. You can see nice videos on YouTube, for example. Experimental measurements have been made that show that this is really looking like an egg. Easter egg, if you like. And why? That's because you get an interior, internal zone here, and you get an external zone here in the contact. And for the internal zone, you get mu zero static friction coefficient. It's for sure. And for the external zone, which is the white in the egg, in the boiled egg, here you get a mu s, which is sliding friction coefficient. OK. And the two zones work together. And the dimension and the proportion between static and sliding zones is changing instantly, depending on the vertical force that, apply, that is applied to the wheel, depending on the road surface quality, depending on almost everything. So it's really difficult to approach. And that's why we don't use a classical friction coefficient like learned in mechanics. Instead, we, we say uh, what we say phi, phi being an adhesion coefficient. Which is an approximation. And this approximation includes this fact that we have and also the uncertainty of this fact. And we also know that this friction, co uh, this adhesion coefficient changes depending on the speed as the tire properties, the rubber properties are changing depending on the speed under the effect of the gravitational force or opposite, under the effect of uh, centrifuge force. So that's why we get a small correction member depending on the vehicle speed. Okay? And using this, all this equation becomes speed dependent. So, but it's not, not only not the unique, not the only speed dependent, speed depending uh, member in this equation. Okay? Is it clear? Usually, scientists study this phenomenon by putting uh, a tire against, a, rubber, uh, against a, a glass surface. So as glass is transparent, they can clearly see the limits of these zones. It's very interesting to see. If they put fluid or water or oil on the glass and they press the wheel, the turning wheel against the glass surface, the oil churning and oil um, whirls show very clearly where is sliding and where is uh, static adhesion. Okay. Then, next component of the resistance is the inertia. is quite easy. We use a reduced inertia, which is rolling. We divide it by the radius of the wheel, Rg square, and we multiply it by the acceleration A that we like to have. So if you don't want to accelerate the car, this force is zero. 
And this rolling inertia, this is the Greek letter of theta, uh, this belongs to all the rotating things inside the vehicle. So transmission shafts, the gears in the differential, the bearings, the cardan shaft, any shaft and rotating gear inside the gearbox, the clutch itself, the, um, the flywheel, the crankshaft, anything that rotates inside, climate compressor, anything that rotates, linked to the wheels. For that reason, this inertia is smaller in two-wheel driven cars, higher in four-wheel driven cars, and in uh, all terrain cars with six or more wheels, it can be a really high value. In the, in the, in the army, you can have special trucks with six wheels driven, or you may have uh, uh, tracked vehicles like, uh, like tanks with a lot of uh, rolling parts, rollers in the, along the tracks, and this value can be high. So that's why usually a Formula One car has better acceleration than an Abrams tank, for example. Not only because of the weight, because of this also, but also because of the number of rotating things inside. What else? Ah, the most important, the air resistance. This is the easiest to catch because F air resistance is nothing else than the density of the air times the square of the velocity divided by two times the cross-section of the vehicle. The cross-section is the front cross-section usually. And times a coefficient called CV in German literature, CX in French literature, and also C something in other countries. And C something or CV for us is the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient says what is the resistance reg uh, linked to the shape of the thing. Okay. I say drag coefficient. Link it to the shape. Usually, the 100% CV is a brick that is put into an airflow. And any modification in the shape that makes the edges less sharp and the front surface more round decreases the CV. Let's say for a car, modern car, the CV is around 0 0.25. For a motorbike, it's 0 0.6, 0 0.8. As the motorbike has usually no fairing, no smooth surface against the wind. And also the front surface counts. A camion, a truck has got much larger front surface than a passenger car. The air resistance is more or less constant and that's your speed, which is also an important factor. The air resistance as such was studied just 100 years ago in the 1920s. And the results were measured and believed by the 1930s. The question was, the basic question was how to increase the top speed of the cars of that time, or locomotives also, for example, how to make quicker steam locomotives. <coughs> and uh, the guy who is studying it, again, a Hungarian guy, of course, the guy name was Paul Yarai.
he was working, I think, in Switzerland, and he was playing by changing the shape of the vehicles. This time you get big square uh, coolers and two large lamps and large fenders on the cars. And the guy, he put the lamps in a streamlined cover and he linked the, the fenders to, the, to the, the cooler. You have a smooth front surface. And the first car maker who understood this, it was Tatra, the Czech car maker. And for the motorbikes, the first to build a wind tunnel to measure this, it was Moto Guzzi. And the goal of this is that if you get a good shape and small front cross section, or even not a small front cross section, but a good shape, you can decrease your consumption or increase your top speed dramatically. And that's why, for example, Tesla Model S has got these strange uh, door mm, handles to form a very smooth outer surface and to decrease the air resistance. And also, if you look at the camions these days, the camions start to lose their mirrors. If you look at new camions, there is no mirror, for example. That's just camera. Because the cross-section of a small electric, electric camera is much smaller than a half square meter large mirror on both sides. Okay? And you can economize fuel or gain speed with that. Again, I had seen on the internet there was, there was a, a Dutch guy with a small motorbike, a Honda Innova. This is what we use in Greece or in, you know, wherever in, in Asia, a step-down small motorbike, like a Honda Cube. And that motorbike is, is an economic one, so it consumes like two, two and a half liter of gasoline by 100 kilometer. kilometer. And the guy was playing to make a fairing, an a air streamed covering to this motorbike. And also in the same time, he decreased, he de decreased the, the sitting position to decrease the height, overall height of the thing. So original motorbike, by sitting origi in original position, you get 2.5 liter of consumption and a top speed of 95 kilometer per hour. And with a complete fairing that looks like a a water drop, roughly. Though it increased the weight of the thing, it decreased the air resistance so much that the consumption went back to 1.5 liter, and the top speed went up over 100 by hour. So it seems to be stupid to put fairings and coverings and streamline everywhere, but it has very important effect. Okay, for those vehicles who want to go fast or for those who want to consume the less possible. No, let's go forward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, reduced, reduced inertia. Because inertias can be computed from one shaft to another shaft. And the inertia from one shaft to another shaft depends on the transmission ratio. That's why I say inertia computed to the out shaft, output shaft, meaning to the shaft of the wheel itself. You have learned in mechanics that inertia is something like inertia equals mass times radius of the center of gravity on square You've learned this in resistance of materials, maybe. So if I divide by air, I get a kind of mass, mass looking quantity that I can multiply by the acceleration. And if you get a system <coughs> that is composed of one shaft transmission ratio, second shaft transmission ratio, and again, you get a kind of transmission ratio and the conical gear system then you get the wheel at the end. 
So you see, transmission ratio here, transmission ratio here, transmission ratio here. And what is interesting is what's on the wheel. So you have to convert all these inertias, all these m times s squares to that r. Okay, that's why I call it reduced, that a red reduced inertia. Okay, now. So, 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 I've got to say, I've got to say the air drag, uh, I will put it here, F air becomes dominant above 80 km by hour. Okay. The inertia works only if we accelerate and the rolling is almost constant. Roughly we can say. Okay. That's why it's important to play with the uh, drag coefficient and front cross section. So these SUVs, these uh, disguised uh, jeeps that we see on the cities with their large front cross section, they are very bad from the economy, from the environment, for example, because at high speed they get a much higher front cross section than the normal passenger car and they consume, they consume more, for sure. You can make anything. You have, for example, these uh, Mitsubishi hybrid vehicles. We get it around Outlander, yeah, Outlander. They get both electric engine and, 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 and uh, gasoline engine. Or you get the Opel Ampera, Chevrolet Volt. They have both electric engine and gasoline engine. While it goes with its electric engine, it smooth, consumes nothing in, in fuel. But once you want to go to the highway with this and the uh, internal combustion engine switch on, you get consumptions like eight, nine, 10 liter by 100 kilometer. Large cross section, bad CV, large weight, okay? So if you want to consume less for protecting the environment, you choose a smaller car. Or you go by bus, no, you go by train if you can. And you don't use the airplanes. No, so there are ideas like that. Okay, so if you want to study, for example, the things at constant speed, And flat road, no uphill or downhill. If you write the equation of resistances, force resistant, F resistant, so you had the F road plus you had the F uh, rolling plus you had the F uh, inertia plus you have the F air. Then you can see if the road is flat, then alpha is zero. So F road is zero. F rolling, it exists. But here, acceleration is, z uh, acceleration is zero. So <coughs> the force inertia is also, also zero. So what you get, rolling resistance and air resistance. For rolling resistance, you use special tires. They are the so-called economical tires or environment friendly tires that has decreased rolling resistance. I mean, they are more stiff than the usual tire. So the adhesion is worse. It's not for racing at all but it saves you five to 10% of fuel. And for the electric cars, the autonomy or range data are usually 
given by specifying that you use special tire that has smaller rolling resistance. Okay? And what happens if you go, you make acceleration, acceleration, acceleration on flat road? Obviously, you get force resistant, F road again, plus F rolling, plus F inertia, plus F acceleration. So if you are accelerating, then still F road is zero, but F inertia will not be zero because you are accelerating your car. So you will have three you will have three non-zero members in the equation. Okay? And also there's a trick of using light alloy wheels because they are very nice and shiny and looking uh, silver and, 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 and so on, they have got effect on the inertia force. And if you want to decide if a nice alloy wheel will be better than your pressed steel wheel, just have a weight scale from your bathroom and put your original steel wheel and the new wheel on the weight scale. And the better is which one? The lighter. the lighter one. And you will be surprised how some uh, cast aluminum wheels are heavy. Because the material, aluminum, has worse mechanical properties than the steel in some cases. So we have to use more and it's sometimes heavier. Okay? The If the alloy wheel is, is containing magnesium, it's a different thing. If the wheel is made of, of, of carbon fiber composite, again, it's a different thing. But this is your bathroom weight scale which will decide if it's worse or not. Okay? So, and the next interesting thing will be a notion Which is a very important notion. No. I say this is the reaction of the engine to the resistance variation. Load. I say resistance. This is also an important thing. Let's have a usual traditional internal combustion <coughs> engine. And here I will use the, the, the speed, kilometer by hour, and the drag force F D to see what happens. Let's say you get a tra given transmission ratio between your engine and your wheels. It's easier to show what happens. So you get a torque curve, a torque curve like that, or a drag force curve like that, where you get a maximum Fd max. Okay? Don't forget that what you see in a curve is nothing else than a constant time C or engine torque. Okay? And let's suppose your car is going or working 
in a in a, uh, at this speed v1 at a constant speed let's call it p point p1 and let's say we get a working point work point p1 at this point you get a speed v1 and a force f drag 1 which you can easily convert to n rpm 1 and torque 1 okay because it's a constant time the same let's suppose that your car or your vehicle it starts to go uphill you get an alpha positive and your st engine starts to go uphill what happens then if you don't change your gas your throttle what will happen sorry you are going from a flat road to uphill uh, 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 uphill road you don't change your throttle you don't change the uh, the you don't increase the pressure on the pedal, yeah. Uh -huh. What happens then? Exactly, the speed. If you don't change your, your, your engine settings at all, but the road starts to go up, then your car will, the resistances are increasing, so your car will slowing down. What happens if your car is slowing down? then your speed v1 goes down till a position v2 and this means that your position p1 go on the left to reach the point p2 okay if you don't change the setting of the engine so if F resistance increases, then speed goes down, decreases, and then P1 goes to P2, then you get a V2 and F drag 2. Or constant times you can convert it n2 and torque 2. Is it okay? This is pure mathematics. If at v2 smaller to v1. Uh, F D two is bigger than F D one. If at V if at V two inferior to V one, we have we have we can have F D two bigger than F D one. Then we have. A stable situation because we get a second stable working point the car will slow down but with unchanged engine settings it will go uphill without problem okay now let's see a second case let's see a second case of similar type again we get the speed in kilometer by hour and here the drag force Newton as usual we draw the same curve here 
here we get the maximum point at drag max. And what happens if our point is just here? Let's call it V3. And this is the point V3, okay? Like this. So here we get the work point P3, and here we get V3 and force drag 3, which is a constant times N3 and the torque. If force resistance increases, again we can say the vehicle speed will decrease, isn't it? But what happens here if the vehicle speed decreases? We go from P3, where do we go from P3? On the left on the curve or? To the right, or the, on the right of the curve, or to the left. Exactly. 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 So here, we can all go only in this direction, if the if the transmission ratio is not changing, and for sure we will go to this, which is P4. And let's see how the engine behaves in such case. P3 to P4, so, 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 V, we get here V4 and force drag 4, that can be transformed easily to N4 and torque 4. And we can say that if at V4 inferior to V3, we get force drag 4 <laughs> inferior to force drag 3, then what happens? Do we have a stable working point? No, you say no, why? It's on the picture. If you want to go uphill, what do you need? You need more drag force. For sure. To go in uphill. And what do we get? What do you get here? If you are slowing down and you don't change the engine settings, what you will get? you will get less drag force. And if you, get, if you slow down more, you get even less drag force and the engine will stall. Okay? So this is what we call, then we have an unstable situation and for that <coughs> we can say that and the engine stalls the engine stops because it cannot provide enough force to <coughs> to continue going uphill okay so in this case, we have to uh, intervene somewhere either in the gear, uh, in, the, in the transmission or in the engine uh, command. Okay, but from our point, our point of view, uh, sorry, from our point of view, we get the following remark here. If 
is at the right from maximum drag force or I can also say maximum torque point then we have a stable work point and if P is at the left from F drag max which is also a constant times torque max then we have an unstable work point okay and that's why it is important to see our curse our engine torque curse so we can play <coughs> with our transmission system only in the limit in the limits where we keep our <coughs> work point in the stable side of the torque curve of the drag force curve at the constant angle set okay it becomes very important that we will talk about the choice of gearbox ratios because we are when we are changing a gear a mechanical gearbox then we are moving away the working point from one position to another yeah question we are going up here yeah Mm -hmm. Do you have a driving license? No. Not yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's a very good, uh, clear idea. So this behavior of changing gears when going uphill, it comes just from this these curves. We get a limited number of variable track force, limited number of variable torque, and if we go till F D max and it's still not enough uh, we can only change the transmission ratio between the engines and the wheel between the engine and the wheels and this we do by choosing a higher transmission ratio in a practic life <coughs> we switch back one gear if it's still not enough we switch back one more gear okay if it's still not enough we switch back one more gear and if it's still not enough, then we will stall and we will cannot go uphill with our engine. This is easy like that. We will talk about uh, soon when we start to discuss about how to choose gear ratios. But is it clear? So we don't switch back till first, only in case of emergency. If we get a very high slope. Usually, the normal roads, at least in Europe, are designed such a way that you could go up in first gear. If you get a, a dirty road in a given country, which is built for human walking, you may have stairs which help you going up, like in, in, in Peru and Chile. Or the slope will be limited to 30 degree, 20 degree, 10 degree, it's a limited value. Okay. If you go to Switzerland, for example, or Austria or northern, northern Italy, they've got a lot of high mountain roads. And uh, the shape of the curvy roads curving left, right, left, right, left, right, and going uphill 
This is exactly in order to keep the slope at an acceptable level. <coughs> okay, you get Gross, Gross Glockner, you get a uh, lot of lot of passes, they call it passes on this region, the mountain roads that goes up and then goes down on the other side. Okay, you get spectacular videos of this on YouTube again. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So the question was that the, 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 the driver for big vehicles try to speed up before reaching the uphill zone, and it's right. And that's because in a, a larger vehicle, let's say a camion, for example, which weighs 40 tons and will have to go uphill soon, so in a, in a camion like this, in the transmission, you get a lot of gears. So you get a big inertia if you want to change the gear itself. And this big inertia is the results a slow changing. Example, you go uphill in the tense gear of a camion, and it's a very, very big slope and your changing, as you get a lot of gears, requires, let's say, two seconds. It can happen that by the time you switch back one gear, in two seconds, you slow down such that it's not enough. And you had to choose the second lower gear regarding to, actu to the actual. Okay? So it's tricky. So being a camion driver is not only tricky in flat roads, but also in mountains. And also the same in buses. In buses, very it's very important to have quick shifting in order to not to lose speed when going uphill. Okay? So gaining speed on flat road before going uphill can be a good thing if the slope is small, so you push a bit more on the gas pedal and you get a higher working point with more power on the engine so you get more reserve till reaching the FD max before, cha before switching back in the gearbox. Okay? And nothing else. Nothing else. So by speeding up on flat road you can just uh, putting your switching back point a bit later. And this is just a simple thing of ener energetic that you have learned in, in, in high school or elementary school. You get the kinetic energy EC equals M ve vehicle weight times speed squared divided by two. You get the potential energy, potential energy EP equals M vehicle weight times G gravity times H. And the sum is constant. If you get more speed, you can go more high before have to intervene, have to change anything in the system. Okay? It's like with the pendulum, you remember. With a pendulum, speed down there is, is higher, then it can go up a bit more. I mean, this is the same basic logic. Okay? Is it clear? Okay. Then, 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 then comes the trick again. The trick is the case of the electric motor. <laughs> because it's tricky. It's tricky. Case of an electric motor. Let's suppose a synchronous motor. A synchronous motor. You get the original, I will here, I will draw the torque, maybe it's easier to see, a torque RPM curve in Newton meter. 
Where do we get here? Here we get a torque maximum. And originally, as we have seen, it has a torque curve looking like that. And here you can see that this is the stable zone. Stable on the right side. And the stable zone is quite narrow. And what you see also that in small electric cars, you don't have gearbox at all. Don't have to change gears. How is it happening? Instead of gear changing, you remember asynchronous current N equals frequency divided by number of pole pairs, magnetic pole pairs in the stator. So from the mechanical point of view, we have a very bad characteristic. Let's see, we get a narrow stable zone, but then comes the electric properties, then comes here the electric properties. And we see that by changing the frequency, we can use that. We can have positive slope everywhere. So here, if you get this famous point P1, if P2 is below the maximum, you just change the frequency and you get the P2. Okay, this is the trick. This is why I say that we have to keep in mind the engine properties in order to design a transmission. This thing you cannot do with a internal combustion engine. It's not possible. But with the electric engine, uh, you get a completely different <coughs> system. So here you say you get frequency one, you get frequency two, you get frequency three. So it's not your electric engine as such that influence the properties, but this is your frequency uh, varying device called inverter that rules the system, that controls the system. And in fact, you get a large stable zone till the zero speed. Okay. So that's why we were talking so much about engines. So from this point of view, the electrical motor is not stable. Yeah. If the electrical motor, the question was if the electrical motor is more stable, I should say yes. If the electrical motor has got a very good uh, inverter, a powerful inverter that can provide high currents at a large domain of frequency, yes, it is. So we don't have to make so many complications from the mechanical side of the transmission. Instead, we get complicated things on the electrical side. We get heavy power electrics in the system. That also needs cooling <laughs> and also needs comp uh, expensive parts. Okay? So for a vehicle, you've got to rule the power in any, pos any possible way. Uh, the difference is that either you rule the power by mechanical, usual tools like shafts, bearings, and, and, and gears, or you rule the power by electrical side with, with, with condensed with capacitors, uh, with coils, and, and, and transformers, and resistors and transistors. Both is possible. Advantage, disadvantage. Uh, on the mechanical side, we get tools and computing algorithms to dimension and to detect and prevent failure. We can compute the lifetime of a shaft. We can compute the lifetime of a gear, roughly, but uh, with sufficient precision. We cannot compute the lifetime of an inverter. We really cannot compute the lifetime of a capacitor. Yet. Maybe in five years we can, but actually we cannot. We cannot compute the lifetime of a soldiering that's built inside a car and has given vertical, horizontal, and lateral accelerations. 
Because if all the parts, the coils, condens capacitors, and wires are okay, but the soldering fails, we are where we are, we are get a failure. Okay. I don't know these tools. I don't know if these tools exist today or not. But it's sure that for mechanical transmission parts like bearings, shaft gears, we do have computing and life est estimating uh, tools. If in a computer your hard disk fails or your video card fails, what happens? You remove the old part and you put it in a new one. Uh, in a car or in a truck or in a bus, these parts are a bit larger and more current and are heavier. So just unplugging a card and plugging a second card may have a problems with the point of view of costs. And actually, there's a full, complete industry being formed based on that and to solve such problems. In this country, we are guys to dismantle and repair batteries for electric cars. There are guys that are specialized in, in dismantling and assembling control cards and inverters and so for electric cards. This is a brand new kind of industry that we see, uh, that we see um, uh, actually here. We see rising actually here. Okay, so um, I'm, a, I'm an old school guy. I prefer the mechanical things to the electric ones. Maybe in some years with more experience I will have also tools for computing the electrical components. Actually, I, can, I cannot. I cannot estimate. The problem with this is that you cannot tell and you cannot see when the electric component, I mean, component will fail. If a shaft starts to fail, you get a noise. If a bearing starts to fail, you get a noise and vibration. Mm -hmm. You see, you get indications. If a soldering, a small metallic drop starts to move away from the, uh, from the fixed surface, you won't see it. The current will have some variations. There will be a small arc. It will be heated up a bit. You won't see it. You won't consider it unless it's completely failed. So you have maybe problems with that. By the time you will be an engineer with experience, you will have more on that in 15 years, 20 years, okay? Now, so this was for the basic ideas of, of stability and instability. And now some words about transmission layout, but really keywords and not a special complicated thing. So transmission layout, the basics. <coughs> Again, I will not give things in detail. I will try to show you the idea. The idea of how it looks like what <coughs> kind of blocks you can have and how this is changing depending on your, on your engine and on your vehicle. <coughs> Classic layout. You get engine, one block engine. Main clutch, this is a second block, 
<coughs> a kind of gearbox. Third block. Then kind of differential. To splitting the torque to the wheels. Usually you get more than one wheel for a car. And wheel drive. Transmission shaft or any other mechanical element. <coughs> okay, this is what we get and what is the tradition for an internal combustion engine driven vehicle. These five blocks, roughly. How it changes depending on the different engines and also depending on the drive philosophies these days. Let's consider the electrical engine. And we get a small or medium size sized vehicle. What we get? We get still the engine, but instead of a complicated, uh, we don't have main clutch at all because electric motors have got torque at zero RPM. So we jump to the gearbox. Instead of gearbox, we get a reducer that contains just one or two transmission ratio, and you don't have to switch it at all. And you get differential and wheel drive. What you see here is that you've got much less mechanical components. Clutch, you don't have it at all. Complicated gearbox, you don't have it at all. You got a so-called reducer, which is just like an industrial gearbox. One shaft in, one shaft out, no changing inside, just some pair of gears. In this case, you get one motor by axle. By axle, I say by two wheels. And there's a second layout that starts to be made which is even simpler from the mechanical point of view, engine, reducer, and wheel drive. What is missing here? You don't have differential. So for that, you get for sure, two motors by axle. If I'm not wrong, in the new Audis or Mercedes, new German cars, you get this layout. There is no mechanical differential because it's expensive. If you get two identical units for driving a wheel, it can be cheaper. But instead, you have to have a very strong uh, failure tolerant electric, co electric control and failure tolerant sensors also to drive the wheels. But it's the actual thing here. Or if you get, for example, these electric bikes or electric scooters, they've got the engine and reducer built inside the wheel in the middle. <coughs> Same layout, but they have got just one wheel, so the one driven wheel, so it's easier. But for cars, this is the future one motor by wheel. But if, and if it's a four wheel driven car, then four motors. 
if you are strong in control and you can make good sensors, failure tolerant sensors. Okay? No, what else? What happens if your electric engine is not driving always the vehicle? So I say electric engine and you get a secondary drive drive unit for four wheel for four wheel drive like in the Tesla dual motor engine model S model S dual motor engine or in the Peugeot's for example in some Peugeot and Citroen engine you get normal layout normal transmission chain for the front wheels for example that always drive in the car and in some cases you have to switch the car in four wheel driven mode and then you've got an electric engine to drive the other two wheels in this case for sure you get the electric engine and also you get a main clutch plus reducer plus differential plus the wheel drive so here in this case you do have a main clutch with the electric engine and the task is the following as you get an auxiliary unit a secondary unit that is not used everywhere or every, in every time just in some special cases you don't have to spin the electric engine in this case because if you spin it it will produce electricity so it will increase the losses of the vehicle and even if it's a constant magnet motor if it turns without any current it will produce electricity so it's easier to switch it off the transmission chain why you don't need it okay and here you do have a main clutch to separate the engine the wheels can rotate but the engine should not okay this is what you have in the front unit of a, of a tesla dual motor engine dual motor vehicle and it's also similar for the uh, for the Porsche Taycan it's not because both front and rear, rear wheels are driven so again a different layout though using the same components okay and one more thing and I will finish for today which is not actually the case but it will be soon let's say in 10 years for sure uh, electric engine and truck truck or bus or large sized vehicle like pickups in the United States, for example, full-size pickups. So let's say heavy things above 3.5 tons, up to, I don't know, 40 tons, maybe soon, in some years. Here, for sure, you will have the engine. And you cannot avoid to have a gearbox. And then the differential and then you will have a wheel drive. This is where you will still have a gearbox. So if you look at this series of layouts 
you can have an estimation of the future that the main clutches as such will disappear, mostly. The gearboxes, the importance of the gearboxes will also decrease a lot. But at the crucial points, the most important points for trucks and buses, they will still remain. But the requirements for the gearbox and the shiftability of the gearbox will change for sure. In an electric car, this will be not you that will shift the gears, like in a classic truck, but there will be a complicated control that controls both the electric engines plus the shifting mechanism of the gearbox. Okay? Do you see the trends? I think it was a bit clear to see what is waiting for us. Okay? Now, I will finish. I will finish here. And we will continue from here next week. Okay? And next week also we will have a test maybe. As usual. Okay. Then thank you for your attention. And we finish for today. Mm -hmm.